The following podcast is going to contain spoilers along with me, just a regular guy, talking about all the things I love, such as comics, movies, television, music, and books. So yeah, proceed at your own risk. Welcome to another episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, and my name, well, my name is Steven. And I'm back once again to relive my childhood, one comic book at a time, because today I'm talking about Blue Beetle number one from DC Comics. This is from April 2nd of 1986. The writer on this issue was Len Wein, pencils by Paris Collins. Inks by Bruce Patterson and Colors by Anthony Tolan. So a little backstory. If you're not really into the Blue Beetle and who the Blue Beetle is, or maybe you've only gotten into comics in the last five years or so, and you're up to date on who the Blue Beetle is now, let's talk about who the Blue Beetle used to be. There were actually four different versions of the Blue Beetle over the years. The first, his name was Dan Garrett. His first appearance was in Mystery Men Comics in August of 1939. This was from a publishing company called Fox Comics. He was the son of a police officer who was murdered by a criminal. His his father was. He too is a cop, a rookie cop, and he fought crime as the Blue Beetle without any kind of superpowers. Though at some point... Apparently, he did get himself a bulletproof costume and even gained temporary superpowers such as super strength and stamina by taking something called vitamin 2X. Sounds very mysterious. Now, eventually, however, over time, he was given the ability to fly as well as x-ray vision. And I guess, depending on which issue you read, he may have had other superpowers that just came and gone depending on issues. Version 2 was from Charlton Comics. They got a hold of the character. They got the they they bought the character, I don't know. But they gave him a revision in 1964. He was still called Dan Garrett, but this time he had two T's at the end of his name instead of one. So this Dan Garrett was an archaeologist instead of a cop, and he finds a mystical scarab during a dig in Egypt, and he was able to use that scarab to turn into the Blue Beetle by saying the words, Kajida! I don't know if he said it like that, but he would say that, and he would turn into the Blue Beetle, and I believe he had superpowers, thanks to the mystical scarab. Version 3, this is who we're going to be talking about today. This is who is in this Blue Beetle comic from 1986. This is Ted Cord. He first appeared in Captain Adam number 83 from Charlton Comics, and he was created by Steve Ditko. He's a genius, an inventor. He has no superpowers at all. He's like a billionaire. He owns his own company, Cord Incorporated, and he uses his money to, and his genius brain to to use, not really a lot, he doesn't have a lot of gadgets. He's got this big bug, this big airship he calls the bug, and... He has a uh, like a gun that shoots out a flash of light or a burst of air to distract people when he's beating them up if he needs a bit of distraction. Ultimately, I think of him as the anti-Batman. He's like, if Batman was happy, that's who the Blue Beetle would be. If Batman was not this stoic, dark, always about the war kind of character, he would be the Blue Beetle. That's why I like the Blue Beetle so much. DC eventually acquired the Charlton characters sometime in the 80s, and they used Crisis on Infinite Earths to bring them into the DC universe. So this is what I'm reading. This is this is when I got into the Blue Beetle was with issue number one back in 86. Now, version four is the current Blue Beetle, Jaime Reyes. His first appearance was in Infinite Crisis number three, 
as Jaime Reyes, and that's from February of 2006. He didn't appear as the Blue Beetle, however, until issue number five. He somehow gets a hold of the mythical scarab that gave Dan Garrett his powers, and we find out that the scarab actually turns out to be alien in origin. It fuses to Jaime's spine, and he uses it to create armor and weapons. It's kind of, he kind of uses it symbiotically. But it creates an armor around him that's kind of insect-like, which gives him that blue beetle look. And he creates, you know, like arm cannons and wings and, and all that kind of stuff. So those are your four versions of the blue beetle. I've never read any blue beetle from our first two versions, from the two Dan Garrett versions. And I have read a bit of Jaime Reyes. And I, I like Jaime Reyes. I really enjoyed... Because I started, it wasn't long after his initial series started after Infinite Crisis that eventually I stopped reading comics, but I really enjoyed his series up until the point that I stopped reading comics. So I'm not one of these anti Jaime Reyes type of people. I'm a big fan of Ted Cord, however. I love them both. Both? Both? I love them both. And I'm not sure where it stands nowadays. I have a feeling that I've read something that Ted Kord is back. Actually, I did read Heroes in Crisis, and Ted Kord Blue Beetle was in Heroes in Crisis. So maybe both of them are now together in the DC Universe. And I hope that's the case, because I like both characters. I just prefer me some Ted Kord. I I don't want to get rid of Jaime Reyes to bring in Ted Kord, but I would like Ted Cord to be around, and it, and it seems like he is. So let's talk about issue number one. So this takes place in Chicago. We open up on a building that is on fire. The Blue Beetle arrives on the scene. He's in his airship, the Bug, and he's got this. It's not quite a trapeze, but that's that's what I'm gonna compare it to. He has basically a line that'll come out of the bottom of the bug and it's got a a pole on it that he can hold on to and he's got controls in his gloves and on the line itself that controls both the beetle and the line. And so he comes down the line and he lands on the roof and he sees somebody up on the roof that is in trouble. Now, in the meantime, the cops are down there. Not the cops. Why did I say the cops? The, The fire department are down there They see the Blue Beetle arrive, and somebody makes mention of him being retired. So, again, I've never read any Blue Beetle up to this point, but apparently he was retired at some point, and he's come out of retirement. So he's on the roof, and he finds somebody up there that he thinks is in trouble, and he's going to go save him. But this person, this figure, this shadowy person, socks Blue Beetle in the jaw, and we find out that he is a bad guy named Fire Fist. And he's a he's a pretty interesting looking guy. He's think of one of those big like biological suits that somebody from the CDC might have to wear when they're dealing with some kind of biological agent. Think of something like that but more rounded at the top and made more of a fireproof type of material. That's kind of a cross between that and an old diving uniform with the big tank on the top of their head, the big globe tank on the top of their head. And he shoots fire out of his fingers, these little nozzles on his fingers. So they fight for a bit, and then Fire Fist escapes, and Blue Beetle plunges into the fiery building to save a trapped firefighter. And once the firefighter is out and safe and he's all cared for, Blue Beetle leaves. He's in the bug, and he flies the bug into Lake Michigan, where he uses a secret tunnel to access his secret lair below the Cord Incorporated building. It's here that we learn the origin of Ted Cord, Blue Beetle, or why Ted Cord is dressing up as the Blue Beetle and is going out and fighting crime. He, at some point, had stumbled across evidence that made it look as if his uncle Jarvis was into some nefarious things, such as building evil robots, maybe, And so he does what I think any normal person would do when they stumble across this kind of information. He enlists the help of his old college archaeology professor to, you know, dig up the dirt to get to the bottom of all this. And that archaeology professor happens to be Dan Garrett. So their their investigation leads them to Pago Island 
and they learn that Uncle Jarvis was up to no good. Dan becomes the Blue Beetle. They fight some robots, but Dan Garrett is killed. And that's when Ted Cord vows to take up the mantle of the Blue Beetle and fight crime. But he doesn't use the scarab. They don't really explain why. If you've read Infinite or uh, bleh, if you've read Crisis on Infinite Earths, which came before this, this is post Crisis. Ted Cord has the scarab, or at least he had it in Crisis on Infinite Earths, but he doesn't use it. He doesn't use it to get superpowers. He's just a regular dude with amazing athletic ability and a winning smile, and he fights crime. So from here, Ted changes out of his Blue Beetle costume so he can go up and be with his people, his employees and whatnot in Cord Incorporated. And he dresses like somebody from a bygone era. I mean, he's wearing freaking saddle shoes, a sweater vest with a sweater vest on top of like a white button-up shirt with his sleeves rolled up past the elbows, like almost up to his shoulders. And he's got one of those hats on, like those newsboy caps. He looks like, I don't know, he looks like Jimmy Olsen. Throw a bow tie on him and he could be Jimmy Olsen back in the 30s. We meet his secretary, Angie, and she's got something going on. They, they sort of hint at it. We don't know what that is. We'll find out in future issues, though. Then we meet Melody and Jeremiah. They are scientists that work for Cord Incorporated. Melody also happens to be dating Ted. He asks them to analyze a charred piece of wood that he took from this building that was on fire. We go from there to Pago Island. A dude named Conrad Carapax. That is a great name. My name is Carapax. Conrad Carapax. And I'm on Pago Island. He's there because he wants to figure out what it was that brought Dan Garrett to the island. He knows there's something on the island that was important enough that Dan Garrett died to try to find it. So he wants to find out what that is. And we learn in this I think it's half a page, maybe a full page, that there's still a big robot down there underground in a secret room. From there, we go to Star Labs where Ted is meeting an old friend, Murray Takamoto. And Murray is trying to alloy Prometheum, which is a constantly renewing energy source, with the titanium vanadium blend. Yeah, I just took that directly out of the comic. I don't know what that means. I don't know what any of it means. But apparently it's so he can create some kind of new armor plating. But they're not having any luck with it over at Star Labs. So he's kind of hoping that Ted and his people will give it a try. Well, as he's explaining it to Ted, there's this janitor in the room. And he's emptying the trash bag, the trash cans. And he's, he's got his mop and all that. And he starts thinking to himself with his big, giant, creepy red, bushy eyebrows. Sorry, gentlemen, but I don't think I can allow that. I'm afraid it would spoil all my carefully laid plans. So we go from there to the Chicago Metropolitan Police Headquarters and Lieutenant Max Fisher. He's working on cleaning out some of his old files and he comes across the Garrett case. Dan Garrett killed in a cave-in on Pago Island, and they never found the body. Well, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it one bit. It doesn't sit well with him, and he thinks it's murder. We go back to Ted. He's still hanging out with Murray. He gets an alert from the bug. He had set up this thing on the bug to look for large fires and to alert him when one breaks out. So he gets the alert, and he takes off, and he changes into his Blue Beetle costume, And he finds the fire. There's a fire station that is just freaking ablaze. And there, of course, on the roof is Fire Fist. So they fight. And it's a nice fight scene. It spans almost three pages. But the fight ends with the ceiling. They've gone into the fire station during the fight because they're all over the place. The ceiling collapses. It's on fire and it collapses on the Blue Beetle. And the issue ends with Fire Fist standing over him, and he's saying, Burn, Beetle, as soon this whole city shall burn. Burn! 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 
Bird. And then he starts laughing. And that's how the issue ends. There is a lot, a lot going on in this issue. I mean, they managed to set up four different storylines. I mean, not only do you have what's going on, the main storyline, Blue Beetle and Fire Fist. We got the guy on Pago Island trying to figure out what Dan Garrett was there for. We got Lieutenant Max Fisher, who wants to look into what he considers the murder of Dan Garrett. And we got this creepy, redheaded, giant eyebrow, bushy eyebrow janitor guy who doesn't like the fact that Ted Cord is going to be messing with this Prometheum stuff. And then plus, I guess there's apparently something going on with the secretary. Again, they, they, they barely hint at it in the issue. So that's, that's like they're setting up five different storylines in one issue. And they still have room for two rather good fight scenes between Blue Beetle and Fire Fist. Now, the art, the art I really enjoyed. It's a very classic 80s style kind of art, you know, like Milgram or Byrne or even Senkevich. If you look at like early Senkevich before he got really weird and really awesome, there's a, there's a very classic house style that between Marvel and DC looked rather the same. George Perez, Al Milgram, John Buscema, John Byrne, all of them, they all had the same basic style. Now, they each had their own unique elements that they would put into their artwork that you could look at and you could kind of, oh, well, that's obviously John Buscema or that's obviously John Byrne. Well, Paris Collins does have it. I think I could pick out some Paris Collins artwork if I saw it in a different book and I didn't know who did it. One of the things that stands out about his art is he's, there's something about the way he draws eyes. And typically when I find somebody, when I'm reading a book or I'm looking at artwork from somebody who's kind of new to, uh, to comics, who's just kind of dabbling, they, they, they're, they're pretty good about the drawing the human figure, but the one thing they can they can never seem to get right are the eyes. There's just something about the eyes that are out of proportion with the rest of the person's body. And you might almost think that at first when looking at this guy's artwork, but because some of the eyes at times are rather large compared to their face. But for some reason, rather than it being distracting or making me think that this guy doesn't know how to draw, I actually rather dig it. It rather works with his stuff. But that's Blue Beetle number one. We're going to talk about more issues in the series. I don't know how many more I've got a handful of them. I've, I've got to try to locate the rest of them. I've been getting them one at a time off of Comixology, and I don't know how many are available on there. But I do... Here's the thing. I don't remember truly reading this series when I was a kid. But I look at the... At the I know I had the issues. I know I've got them somewhere up in the attic. And I do... There are certain panels in this book that I do remember. I clearly remember the, the cover... And I clearly remember Fire Fist. So I know I read this when I was a kid. And I, I have this feeling of nostalgia just yanking on my heartstrings as if to say, you loved this book. Read it. Read it. You must read it. And so I read it. And I really enjoyed it again. Obviously, I enjoyed it the first time. I didn't remember anything about it other than a few elements. But I really enjoyed it. This, this, I guess, second time through. And again, if you want to read it, it's available on Comixology. The single issues. It doesn't appear to be traded anywhere or a part of any, a part of any trade. And that's, that's kind of the thing I really like about Comixology because say what you want about digital comics. If a book comes out that you missed and your, your local comic shop can't get it in, maybe it's sold out, you can get the digital version on Comixology. I guarantee. And I guarantee you can probably find these issues in the back issue bin somewhere for fairly inexpensive. I don't think these are going for a lot of money. But that's it. That's my episode for today. Blue Beetle number one, continuing my journey through childhood, through comic books. So until next time, I'm Steven, and I'm just another fanboy. Be nice to each other, folks. I'm out. Just Another Fanboy is a presentation of the Stephen or Else podcast. Questions and comments can be directed to feedback at stephenorelse.com. 
You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Orr and get instant access to the My Other Podcast podcast, a weekly show about whatever crawls its way into my tiny little mind just moments before I tap record. You can find me on the World Wide Web at StephenOrElse.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching for at Stephen or else. I also encourage you to subscribe to the show, leave us a five-star review, and share this episode with a friend. Just Another Fanboy is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. You can find that over at ComicsPodcasts.com. All links will be in the show notes. Good job. Mm.